Part of the thrill of making flower pots is delivering them to people that use them and bring them to life. And today I'm here at Atlock Farm, a topiary farm that I've wanted to visit for years, delivering some pots to Ken Salodi, the owner, who's going to take us around and teach us all about the fascinating world of topiaries. So Ken is going to show us how to actually start a topiary from a cutting. So let me show you. Uh, if we had a plant like this that we were going to trim. Yep. This is rosemary? This is rosemary. This is more or less a finished rosemary. Okay. And every once in a while you've got to trim them. You've got to do maintenance. Yep. We cut in silhouette so that we can see what's sticking out from the ball and you keep refining the shape. So now we have all of these. We've got all these cuttings. And, you, and we can use these to propagate new topiaries? New topiaries. So we want to cut off the bottom branches and then you want to cut just below where the leaves were attached. So you want the little stump yep. to be just below that node because the cellular material that's going to push out the roots the best is located right in right where the leaves were attached. Okay. And then just touch the end of it to rooting, rooting hormone. And then we use moist rooting medium. But, but you could use soil or You perlite. could use soil, perlite, yep. sand, a okay. mixture of the two. A lot of those things work. Just to start the cutting. Just to start the cutting. How long will it take for these rosemaries, uh, these new little cuttings to root? Depending on the time of the year. Yep. They go quit more quickly in the spring, the summer than they do in the fall and the winter. Mm -hmm. But it's going to be at least a month. Okay. And then when they root, yeah. they'll start getting more robust and... Wow. So we just did these today. This is like a month later. And then how old is this right here? Yeah, this is maybe two and a half months. Okay. After the whole, maybe three months ago, the, the process started. Beautiful. So there's a nice plant. Now you can see that this plant is growing straight up. Mm -hmm. All right. And everything's fine. This one is already gotten to a point and an age where it's starting to fall down on itself a yep. little bit. So before it starts doing this, or even worse, yep. we want to start working with it. Now, this is an unpinched cutting. Remember, we didn't pinch the tops out yep. of any of these cuttings. So that top is still there. Mm -hmm. It's still piling new growth on top of itself. Mm -hmm. It's also gotten to a point where it's mature enough to start doing side branches. Okay. These side branches, notice, no side branches. Yep, just right? one thing at the top. It's, and they just don't not grow. You have to take them away. Because mm -hmm. if you didn't take them away, the plant would spend a lot of energy and time growing side branches and to the detriment of growing straight up. Yep. It would become this, this bush. So we go in and we clip away side branches right against the stem, as close to the stem as possible. We don't want to leave any little stubs. I want to take off the side branches, but I want to leave leaves because it, we can't cut away all the leaves or it won't photosynthesize. So now they've got to be staked as straight up and down as we can, and push it down to the bottom of the pot, mm -hmm. and there we go. And then we tie with raffia we use raffia because raffia rots. Mm -hmm. Eventually, raffia will become weak and break. Mm -hmm. Now, we have to determine whether or not this will be a 10-inch topiary mm -hmm. or an 18-inch topiary or a 24-inch topiary. We have mm -hmm. to decide that. If it's going to be a 24-inch topiary, like this, we have to allow that central leader to continue to do its thing, mm -hmm. and it's going to continue to add more and more growth the top of the stem, but just as it was doing here, side branches were coming out. Mm -hmm. So as it adds height, if there are any more side branches, and there will be, they have to be taken away. Okay. Now, we allow this process to continue, a little growth, a little removal, a little growth, a little removal, until it gets to the height that we want it to be. Then we have to form the head. The central leader is still there, mm -hmm. and it still wants to grow up in a straight line. Mm -hmm. We have to take away the central leader, mm -hmm. and now everything that's left will start growing branches. Okay. All right. And what we want to do is we want to have three sets left. One, two, 
three. Right. Okay. Because now that we've taken out the central leader, yeah, we're going to force the plant to grow from where the leaves are. So, in time, two branches will grow from there. And then two branches are gonna grow like this and this. Right, and, and two, two branches, branches, you could already see the two branches coming from the right. top, right? And that's gonna fill it out. And it's at that point that you come in with your paper scissors. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's no longer necessary to go back and count, you know. You just, you've got enough of a head going on there to come in and start clipping away. It is mathematical. It is, but don't tell people that because you'll, you'll scare them away. <laughs> <laughs> but today we are in Chicago at the world's leading harp manufacturer, Lion and Healy. This instrument is something that I have dreamed of playing for a long time. I have my good friend Caroline with me and we're here to tour this wonderful factory where these incredible instruments are still made by hand the old way. Carving is so specific and so detailed, like there's nowhere to hide any flaws. Yeah. It feels like to be able to do something like this, you really need to know what you're doing, right? Definitely. Some of our employees have worked here over 25 years, up to 40. Wow. Um, and so the patterns are almost like inside their mind. They're following a template because they've done it so many times before, but then also using their own taste and responding to the wood. Raul, how long have you been working here? Almost like 42, 42 years. 32 years, yes. wow. 32 years. Well, carving is something that's very dear to me because I carve okay. as a hobby. Mm -hmm. And I have my little setup at home with my chisels. Really? And I have a yeah, little horse that I put on the table okay. that I carve against. But to see this, to see the beauty. Can you tell us about your tools? You sharpen them, like how often do you have to keep them okay. sharp? Um, two hours or a week. Really? Yeah. Two yeah. hours yes. of sharpening? Yeah, everything. Oh, everything. to sharpen yeah, everything. Right. May, right. I, may I pick one up? Sure. So here's the thing about our tool. If if it's sharp, if a chisel is really sharp, when you when you touch it, it should make your It should make your They have to be really sharp, right? Yes. Just just go like this. No! Just, just do it, just, just put your finger there. Just, just. You see what I mean? And Macy just go like, oh. but this is so important to your job, right? Sharp yes, tools. Yes, yes, very important. Can I try? Sure, why not? <laughs> <laughs> Carrie, am I allowed to try? She said I can try. Okay. Okay, okay you show. Okay, okay, you show me what to do, and I'm gonna try doing it. Okay. You can do it like this. See? Small. Okay. okay. It's hard. What's what? What is this? This is a maple. Oh, so it's hard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's... And then you go through, you turn right. the chisel, right. and you go this way yeah. to clean it up, right? Wait, like that. Mm -hmm. Good job. Great, where's my paycheck? <laughs> Look at that. Yeah, it's, cl it's, it's, nice. it's clean because it's sharp. Yeah. Wow, that's... Thank you. Thank You're you for letting... No this problem. is an honor to just have a few little notches on a lion and Healy harp. I never, ever thought I would... I would be allowed to do this, so thank you. You're welcome. I was just going to watch you work. What are you doing? <laughs> Slow that wheel down. Slow the wheel down. I can't believe it. You're throwing like a second grader. <laughs> Who told you to throw like that? Do you want me to center it for you? What? Slow the wheel down. In 2009, I got my <laughs> monthly issue of Martha Stewart Living. I was in my final year of college and this wonderful potter was in the magazine making flower pots for Martha and I had been, at that point, I had been working on the pottery wheel at school for about 10 years and I read about you and I just knew right away. <laughs> I have to, I have to meet this man, and I want to learn from this man. So I called Guy on the telephone, and I said, "Can I come and apprentice with you?" And Guy very politely declined and said, "No." no. <laughs> he said no. <laughs> so I, I had to try something else, and I wrote him a letter, 
And um, didn't I, I said no thanks, right? You said you <laughs> see, you we were the guy was very polite about saying no. No, but you have to understand. Most people when they get a letter, it doesn't look like it's from a friend of D Darcy or Elizabeth Bennett or I mean it was an 18th century scroll with this incredible line. And as a potter, I'm going okay, there's 20 years of hard work to be able to make that lettering. Anybody that can do that is in the business, we have the word handy. So somebody that is able to write a letter like that right away is usable, is trainable, and is worth the space they're gonna take up. Hey, you want this one? That's what an apprentice is for. There you go, bro. I'm gonna do just a little bit. What, it wasn't good enough? I just wanna feel the clay. <laughs> So clay is made out of platelets of glass. Platelets of glass are long and thin. So you want to get them so that they're all going in the same direction. So basically when you're talking about using a wheel, the thing that makes it uh, incredibly exciting is it's basically the laws of architecture in motion. So a pot can have an arch, it can have a straight, or it can have a dome. There's nuance in the form. Now I'm pushing in from the outside and I'm pushing out from the inside. And the activity between those two things is what's making the clay rise. I'm gonna be making a bottle, so I'm just gonna close this in a little bit. So that flat tool that Guy's using right now is called a rib. So the rib to, is to the potter exactly what a violin bow is for a fiddle player. This amplifies those things I talked about, the arches, straights, and domes. Do you know where the shillelagh is? Yeah. I have the shillelagh. <laughs> we made a tool for Rajiv for working on the inside of the bottle. And it's just if you want to get inside the pot and See how there's this little dent here? I want to get that just to come up a little your, bit. Your hand won't fit inside. So this thing is a useful little tool. Guy makes so many of his own tools. And that has been a fascinating thing to see over the years. He needs just the right thing for it. Well, he runs down to the basement where there are a bunch of power tools and he makes what he needs. Beautiful. Today, I am visiting one of my favorite stores here in New York City, East Coast Trimming home of Hyman Hendler and Sons. It's a treasure trove of ribbon. Wow, this is like, look, just look at the label. What? That's older than me and, me and you together. Look at this. Yeah. Look at this. This is, so is this grow green? I, I would think it's probably a cotton. Okay, this is the, this is the winner so far. Look at this. That's older than me. Really? Yeah. Like, what's what's sort of the oldest ribbon that we might find in here? Well, I'm 81, and you're looking at maybe, uh, could be over 100. Really? Some of them, yeah. But they had terrific artisans in those days working these mills. If it had one loom, yep. that was a home. If it had two looms, it was a mill. Okay. Three looms was a big mill already. The ribbon was produced in these people's homes? Yeah. So there was a there was a connection to individuals. Yeah. It wasn't just all produced in huge factories. It would take four to six months maybe to see anything from the samples that he sent. Wow. So it wasn't fast fashion. No. And then the, and then this is what happens. What was supposed to be a 15 minute task in between all the things that I was supposed to do today, two hours later, you're still looking at all the different. Your problem is you have good taste. That That's why you come to our shop. That's the problem. That is the problem. <laughs> we are in the windy city of Chicago. Today we're doing something I love doing as a leisure activity. Going to junk shops, thrift stores, antique malls, and looking for treasure. Oh, I need a few planters. Let's go to Ikea. Well, you buy your planters at Ikea, and they're the sort of thing that everybody has on their shelf in their home. And here, look at these. Two little planters, vintage McCoy planters. They're 
This is in perfect condition, perfect, made in the USA, and these two planters are $15. I would say probably that's even cheaper than going to a big box store. And they're, they're unique. You're not gonna see these everywhere. Look at those, they're great. I love these, these little cast iron stove over there. Those were salesman samples in the 1800s. So a person that sold big cast iron stoves would take that around to show potential buyers what the actual stove would look like. It was like a miniature model. You see things that you never would have even thought of, but that strike up an idea. Like, hmm, those leather punches over there, I'm looking at them, and they have designs on the top. They have letters on them. Could I use them for clay for my flower pots that I've been making with Guy Wolf? Like, maybe that would be a cool thing to punch into the clay. And sometimes it's a great idea, and you end up finding something like this at, a, at an odd place that you end up using for years and years and years. I know Guy has done exactly that. A lot of his tools and things that he impresses into his flower pots, he's just picked up randomly um, without going out there and looking for that specifically. So it's just fun. It's fun to just keep your eyes open and look at everything and just see what happens.